Alrighty. Oops. Uh -oh. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's Global Conversation Grand Challenges, where we will be discussing feeding the world. We are so thrilled to have you join us as we embark on a journey to explore one of the most critical and pressing issues of our time, ensuring access to safe, nutritious, and abundant food for a growing global population. The challenge of feeding the world is immense as we strive to meet the needs of a population projected to reach 9.7 billion by 2050. As we stand at the intersection of a growing world population, climate change, resource scarcity, and the need to protect our planet's fragile ecosystems, the question of how we can sustainably nourish everyone becomes increasingly complex. Throughout this academic year, we will hear from Cal's faculty and staff whose work contributes to solving some of these issues. Together, we will delve into innovative strategies, best practices, and the latest research that can help us not only meet the world's food demands, but also do so in an environmentally responsible and ethically just manner. My name is Julia Frangle, and I am the CALS Global Research and Partnerships Coordinator and your host for today. CALS Global facilitates and supports international engagement for faculty, staff, postdocs, and graduate students, as well as cultivates international partnerships and hosts, inter and hosts international visitors. For our talk today, I will introduce each speaker prior to their presentation, and then there will be time for Q&A after each. Please also feel free to put questions in the chat as you think of them. Today, we have asked our speakers to touch on the following questions. From your area of expertise, what innovations hold the most promise for contributing to a world that is safely and sufficiently fed? Where does your field need to grow to address gaps in how it understands and approaches feeding the world? What is the most important thing you've learned through your work so far as it pertains to feeding the world? And what advice do you have for someone getting started in your discipline who wants to address food systems and security on a global scale? Now, without further ado, allow me to introduce Dr. Russell Groves. Dr. Groves is a professor and chairperson in the Department of Entomology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The majority of his effort is devoted to management of insects and vegetable crops. He has responsibilities for insect pests affecting all scales of production, including commercial, organic, and fresh market vegetables. His lab group focuses on applied insect ecology with an emphasis on insect vector-borne diseases of specialty crops, insect dispersal and movement, and insecticide resistant management. And now I'll hand it off to you, Dr. Groves. All right, thanks, Julia. Well, while I'm attempting to share a screen, um, let me say thanks for uh, the opportunity to be here and present to everyone. It's, a, it's actually a privilege. And Julia, you can give me a thumbs up if you can see that well. Very okay. good. Um, so thanks again for the introduction. Um, Again, my name is, is Russ Groves. I'm the uh, chair of entomology. And as in my introduction, I do work on vegetable crops. Um, I was thinking about my title. I should have probably renamed my title uh, towards the discovery of neuropeptides, to be quite honest, because we're gonna go through a bit of a story and we'll arrive um, there uh, in terms of the development of new biologics. So bear with me. Um, as, as I get to that point. Um, it's important for me to recognize the people that actually do the work in our lab. If you're interested, you can visit our website, which you see on the right, but it's really the people on the left that do um, the vast majority of the work. Uh, Chris Bloom, Matt Pereira, our PhD students in the lab, Victoria, Emma, Morgan, are all master's students that are working on, on really a wide variety of questions um, that that I'd be happy to chat with anyone about um, in the future. What I'm gonna focus a little bit on today uh, really goes back probably as much as six or eight years in my lab. Uh, one of the individuals that's a key, uh, key contributor was a, um, a PhD student and then subsequently a postdoc, uh, Dr. Justin Clements. Justin now is a lead scientist at the Los Alamos National Lab uh, in New Mexico. And um, and he was he was a, as a postdoc uh, someone who contributed a lot to this work. 
I need to recognize also my collaborator in entomology, Dr. Sean Scoville, who I rudely have spelled, misspelled his name. It's S-C-H. I want to give him that credit. And then also Emma Terrace. Emma's a grad student uh, in the lab uh, who has been actually working on the project that we'll arrive at ultimately. Another partner is Greenlight Biosciences. This is a biotechnology company um, that has been working on RNA interference uh, for the last decade, and we've had some close collaborations with them. And I'll try to recognize some of those collaborations as they're, as they're relevant and important. A, a cooperator and collaborator also is Dr. Umut Toprak. Umut is a um, professor at Ankara University, uh, uh, located in Ankara, Turkey. Um, and Umut has close associations uh, with uh, two uh, agricultural entities in Turkey, uh, Hektash and also Oyak. Uh, these are two companies that work on uh, agricultural development. They're into biologics. Um, well, as you can read, um, a variety of a variety of different um, plant management, uh, plant protection uh, elements that are um, important for some of the investigations uh, that that we've participated in. And Julia, I just put these here. Um, these were the prompts that were given to myself and Dr. Worley uh, uh, for us to think about uh, the, uh, what innovations hold promise uh, with respect to uh, safely and efficiently you know, feeding a world population. Where does our field need to grow um, and address uh, gaps in our understanding to be able to feed the world? Um, what are some of the important things that we've learned so far as it again pertains to feeding the world and what advice can we give to anyone entering? Well, it is interesting. I don't want to get, you know, too down in the weeds and, and with respect to the social or socio-political dynamics of, of literally the words feeding the world, because that means different things to different people. And that has meant different things um, probably over the last maybe two to three decades. Um, and to be quite honest, I'm I'm hoping that at least through the information that I'm going to provide today, that I can help to answer some of these questions uh, as it relates to uh, insect pest management. Wisconsin does contribute in, uh, to feeding the world, if you will, uh, and uh, a state situated in the upper Midwest, it does contribute substantially to food production. These are just a, a few of of the um, of the food products that you'll find that come from uh, Wisconsin, their acreage estimates, their their value proposition, their national ranking, you'll find most of these foods in the middle of the grocery store and the freezer. Uh, Wisconsin has a long history of this production. Um, many towns in Wisconsin historically would would have a a cannery or a food processing uh, entity. And so that is something that that is is part of our history with respect to to food production, and, and that's something to celebrate. It's certainly something that's uh, very worthwhile and noteworthy. But it's also something that doesn't come without consequences, to be quite honest. Um, and in fact, many of our consumers, as you might imagine, um, we're learning about, have interests around food safety, and maybe. Food safety in the context of, of associated residues or, or residues on the crop. And many of our retailers, whether you want to call it greenwashing or not, uh, are actually setting standards that are um, well below uh, tolerances, USDA tolerances uh, for MRLs or maximum residue limits. Um, in fact, one of the largest food providers in this country uh, back in around 2010, made the statement that they were going to offer product that had no detectable residues. And to be quite honest, that's a significant hurdle. And that and that provider has the name Walmart. Um, and in fact, because we do a lot of export um, in this country, and we do we do some export in Wisconsin, many of the pesticides um, and especially the older pesticides that we're that we have used are no longer being re-registered. And in fact, what we're having to do is, is incorporate or think about the use of biologics 
or biological insecticides. These are part of what we need to look forward to as far as con contributors in our overall food system. A couple of other factors that are influencing our pest management and pest management and agricultural production systems is water. Not only quantity, but with, with specific respect to quality. Um, we've seen the Department of Agriculture and uh, the, the State Analytic Lab uh, looking for detecting uh, issues with respect to emerging water quality. In fact, this slide is, is to be quite honest, quite old, um, just illustrating some of the distributions of, of the kinds of, of pesticide contaminants that we find um, within and throughout both our surface and groundwater resources. Again, this is perhaps not unexpected, but this is a consequence. This is a consequence of what is our, our historic and to some extent our current pest management programs uh, in terms of, of feed and food production. Uh, something else that's, that's actually emerging most recently um, is, well, it's been legislation that's existed for now close to 50 years and that was since the inception of the uh, US EPA was the Endangered Species Act. And uh, not everyone remembers perhaps that the Endangered Species Act has had the authority to regulate pesticide registration and re-registration. But in fact, their ability to do so has been sequestered um, in litigation for going on 35 and 40 years. Most of the major global registrants have, have, um, have effectively been uh, limiting the implementation of the Endangered Species Act. The National Academy of Science, however, in 2016, uh, produced a report that it effectively broke free these litigations. And right now in the popular press and well at the National Registry, you can see and learn a lot about how the Endangered Species Act is having reasonably significant effects on the re-registration or registration of current insecticides. Again, a reason for us to ask the question, are there ways to do business better? Are there ways that we can have more success? I think one of those things uh, we thought about and thought there was promise of, at least in specialty crops, was genetic uh, through genetic modifications. Uh, th these data are, are, are now a decade old. I think they're still close to being relevant. But you can see in the in the major uh, feed and forage crop industry, the vast majority um, uses um, um, these kinds of of uh, event based amendments. Um, when we get to specialty crops, it becomes it becomes fewer quickly. Um, actually, papaya ring spot virus resistant papaya was developed by Dennis Gonzalez, at Cornell University. Now going on almost twenty years ago. And there's some sociopolitical uh, questions about the, the longevity of that technology. Not too many people actually know there's a zucchini yellow mosaic virus um, uh, RNAi based event in um, in summer squash. Um, and in the fresh in this fresh market environment, there's no need to actually publicize that. but but those are really just a few. And to be quite honest, if we look back, this goes all the way back to 1991. Transgenic potatoes developed by Monsanto in 1991. And this is a statement that actually a colleague that we unfortunately lost in our department uh, just this August, Tom German, made with Tom Zenon. And that is that, oh, it seems, it seems likely that we're going to be using these materials in commercial potato production in the future. That's interesting to me. We do not plant a single acre of GM potato at this time. And there are sociopolitical reasons for that, but that technology has not gained traction. So some of the questions are, what can we do? I mean, are there opportunities? Are there ways that we can even think of making changes like without adding foreign DNA and maybe circumventing the, the plant incorporated protectant review process? Not that that's a good thing or bad thing necessarily, but, um, and those include things like RNA interference, CRISPR, which you probably learned about gene editing, and then even cisgenics, where we're talking about adding genes from um, sexually compatible plants uh, to reach uh, these programs. And I want to talk a little bit today about some of our work with RNAi or RNA interference. 
And to be honest, I think, you know, here's where science literacy is important, you know, to help the public understand the value that some of these technologies bring. I mean, RNA is, is actually an ongoing biological process that happens in every cell of, of, you, of most eukaryotes um, all the time. And it is effectively um, the manner in which um, uh, small RNAs or mRNAs are neutralized, and it's effectively the stop switch of protein synthesis. Um, and and again, this well, this this um, this uh, approach also is a, is is used for uh, combating a lot of parasitic organisms like viruses. And just so everyone knows and remembers, right? I mean. This we want to give credit to the to the Nobel laureates that did this in C. Elegans in, in 2006, and that is Andrew Fire and, and Craig Mello. But they recognize that you know single stranded RNA would often loop on itself, make a hairpin, and it was that hairpin of double stranded RNA, if you will, that was the inducer of the RNAi silencing complex. And so I'm just going to very quickly do this for you. You can all remember the central dogma on the left, protein synthesis. Well, if you introduce a piece of double-stranded RNA, the enzyme dicer will, will go to, will, will cut that up into smaller pieces. Single strands of those will be payloaded into the RNAi silencing complex, which is a fancy name for a mass of proteins, that, can, that go hunt for that that sequence section and will cut or cleave it and be and silence it. So of course this was the basis of oh my goodness this is amazing technology can we use this to silence genes a, a really cool process right so again this this uh you know this has been known for oh my goodness you know obviously now going on a couple of 20 years and and to be honest there's only one formal registration of an RNAi technology in agriculture right now that's a smart stacks pro it's an RNAi based approach in uh, ex expressed in the root system of corn uh, targeting the corn rootworm um, but on the right the Colorado potato beetle were very near the very first registration of the Colorado potato beetle um, RNAi and Greenlight Bioscience is actually working on an RNAi to target the Varroa mite, a major pest in honeybees uh, that has a lot of impact. In terms of RNAi, there's a there's a there's a lot of evidence that suggests the potential. The, it it is interesting. The regulatory framework around this is, I would say, still evolving. Um, in I, both NIH, FDA, and EPA are, all, are are thinking about you know how these things are are being registered and what the implications are. And to be quite honest, I'll, I'll, I'll stick right to the end or skip to the end here and say that that this the signal or the manner in which the RNAi signal is is well understood as far as its mobility or movement intracellularly is not great. And that in some ways is, is, is kind of taming the development in all insects. For us, what did we do? The way we set out to do this initially, we were trying to explore the genetics of insecticide resistance. And what we were doing is characterizing a certain select set of genes. So we were learning that there might be a, a specific cytochrome P450 or a glutathione S transferase that were really operative in giving the Colorado potato beetle its, its ability to detoxify compounds, whether through phase one or phase two detoxification. And then like many people do, you use RNAi to do loss of function or gain of function assays. And we did this. And it was really quite cool because Actually, when you create a dsRNA and add it with an insecticide, to be honest, that's lost efficacy due to resistance, you can see the, the pictures on the left, just the addition of the double-stranded RNA in relatively small quantities can knock down the resistance mechanism in the insect, making it susceptible. Somebody might say to me, well, Russ, that's not very insightful. You don't want to be able to go back and use older insecticides, and that's not our point. Our point there was just to validate the function of the gene. But when we started publishing on this, we started getting calls from these biotech companies. One was Greenlight Biosciences, which we've worked with for a few years now. Um, they have their own dsRNA that focuses on a nuclease that's in the gut membrane. It knocks out the insect's ability to detoxify mid-gut tissues. The phenotype is the insect feels like it's full constantly and it quits feeding. 
And after four or five, five days of quitting feeding, it dies of desiccation. So it's kind of cool. I mean, and in fact, it's modified to specifically just target um, the, a, a, a gene in the Colorado potato beetle. And the result there is, if it's only targeting the Colorado potato beetle, then a lot of the broad spectrum insecticides that we had historically been using might be rendered you know, less useful because they're killing everything. And so just this is just one example of the fact that we see lots of natural enemies rebounding in fields where we see these kinds of tools. So again, it gives us a, a, a ton of value add to bring these, uh, to bring these back in, into these systems. This led to the beginnings of our international relationships with uh, Dr. Tofrak, Ankara University, um, where we started to then work with him to try to better characterize ways to control the Colorado potato beetle. What we started going after were, was calcium, 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 and a very important signaling molecule in, in many different organisms. And what we were doing there was trying to determine the, the patterns of calcium signaling, the genes that were involved, and could we identify these genes that were involved in calcium signaling as a means of control? And you might say, well, why do we care about going after calcium signaling is because calcium and calcium signaling is a, is a significant process in the insects successfully overwintering. This Colorado potato beetle overwinters underground. It's underground right now. It has to last all winter long. It, it feeds on its own lipid um, stores. And if we can knock out those genes that are signaling for lipid metabolism, we might actually be able to have some success. And so that's what we did. And we worked on and, and had identified uh, both um, calmodulin and, and also to a lesser extent, uh, calcineurin as, as a couple of very functional targets for this work. We also learned that these technologies uh, are under control by um, uh, neuropeptides. So then we asked the question, can we just move upstream and target neuropeptides? Can we think about some like upstream more master regulators that, that could be affecting? Now, remember, we should be focusing on Colorado potato beetle and we shouldn't be thinking about, you know, a set of master regulators that would kill or that would target all insects. So that's the goal here. But again, our collaboration with Amut uh, has led us in this direction. And, and, and both Sean and Emma have been involved. And now we are trying to characterize and discover these neuropeptides that are the regulators of calcium, or excuse me, of lipid biosynthesis, as again, regulated by calcium signaling. And here again, we're looking at, at pre-diapause. Diapause is a technical term for overwintering. We're looking at, at pre-diapause or diapause or post-diapause of developmental stages of the insect we're doing dissections of different tissue types, the nervous system. That's what this illustration here is on the right. Um, centrally in the middle of this, of, this, of this insect dissection is the central nervous system. You can see the, the little white dots representing the thoracic ganglia of the insect here. Also looking at fat body and looking at midgut tissues because this is the site of activity of many of these neuropeptides. Wanting to then characterize the prevalence or abundance of these Things that we're thinking about are like adipokinetic hormone or neuropeptide F. And if these things are in su sufficient quantities and, and proximities, if you will, then the next steps will be silencing. And maybe in a year or two, I can report um, on the outcomes of that. So I go back to these questions. So I think these technologies hold significant promise. These kinds of approaches, their specificity and their lack of impact on non-target organisms have, have a great deal of value over conventional insecticides. In terms of the second question, this is one area that we need to explore, these gaps in understanding. We, need to, we also need to understand that we must develop very specific technologies. This is what's really fun and cool is these two companies, both Hektash and Oyak, in Turkey are, are very well aware of the need to develop these kinds of approaches. Um, and so what's the most important thing? These kinds of collaborations are great. They're cool uh, in terms of being able to uh, intersect our interests and in technology uh, for populations around the globe. What advice do I wanna give someone? Uh, these kinds of partnerships are critical. And so 
We look forward to that uh, into the future. I'm at time, and I want to be uh, I want to be respectful of my colleague, uh, Dr. Worley, uh, and so uh, I'll leave it to Julia. But if there are are questions that people have, I'm I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to take those now. Yeah, we have time for one or two questions. If you want to unmute yourself or you can put a question in the chat. I see I have some friends on this call. So my friends, don't be hesitant. You can, you can ask me whatever you like. I see I've thoroughly confused the crowd. One thing you mentioned that I thought was really interesting was the importance of science literacy, um, which I totally agree is something that is so important, especially for understanding these topics, the polysocial um, backlash to them. Um, and I was wondering what tips you might have for, for overcoming that and making science literacy more. Well, it's a, it, there's a need to, you know, to, to be able to communicate. So, I mean, I'm partially an extension funded uh, scientist as well as a CALS funded scientist. And I think that's, that's part of our charge. And Rodrigo is, has a similar appointment. So, you know, I think part of our job is to, is to make this kind of information more accessible uh, at, to a broad range of people. Uh, and when we can do that by, you know, trying to uh, make these technologies less jargon filled, be respectful of the different places that people come from and when and how they come to different um, uh, opportunity, you know, educational opportunities um, and make the effort and try to make the effort to bring everyone in an audience along with you. You know, again, be careful. We, we've all attended that seminar where someone started out with so much jargon that, that they lost a lot of people very quickly. And so it's incumbent upon us to, to not lose that audience and, and to, to make not only the public, but even the agriculturalists, you know, have a better understanding of the science and technology that we're using and have them understand, uh, you know, the value proposition. And, and I'll just add, Julia, I, I, I mean, th these are really cool technologies, really cool science, and they have a significant promise. I'm not saying that we walk headlong into these technologies either. I'm saying that we, we, we continue to explore, we continue to better understand any unanticipated consequences that may emerge. But again, I might go so far as to say a lot of the you know, the event-based agriculture that's been in field and forage crops for the last 30 or 40 years. I mean, there's some social questions, there's some, you know, uh, sociopolitical questions, there are some uh, antitrust questions, but the actual fundamental nature of that biology, I'm going to argue, has not really resulted in, in, in any of the catastrophe that, that might have been um, offered uh, 20 and 30 years ago. So again, I think these are, I think these technologies deserve our, um, our consideration as a way of, if you will, assisting in feeding ourselves and others around the globe. Nelly. Well, thank you so much. This was fascinating. And I hope to have you back in a year to <laughs> hear more about the results. Thank you. Um, thank you. And for now, we our next guest is Dr. Rodrigo Worley. Dr. Rodrigo Worley is an associate professor and extension cropping systems weed scientist in the Department of Plant and Agroecosystem Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research and extension program, also known as WISP Weeds, focuses on integrated approaches to weed management in corn, soybean, and small grains in Wisconsin farm systems. Dr. Worley received his bachelor's in agronomy from Sao Paulo State University in Brazil and his master's and PhD degrees in agronomy with specialization in weed science from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. 
Before joining UW-Madison, Dr. Worley served as an assistant professor and extension cropping system specialist at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln West Central Research and Extension Center. And Rodrigo, I'll leave it to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, for the opportunity for that introduction. Can you see my slide? Can you hear me well? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a true honor uh, to be here today uh, following Dr. Grove's year, uh, particularly no pressure. I wish I had gone first. Uh, that was a very, very excellent presentation. So my focus uh, here today will be to discuss the impact that weeds have in agriculture. Uh, I'm going to be using uh, water hemp and soybeans uh, as my uh, case study, but hopefully the information uh, applies uh, to other weeds and other crops uh, out there. And as Julia uh, indicated, uh, I have a research and I also have an extension uh, appointment. So our research program, uh, we do a lot of applied work that is focused on helping our growers and our agriculture industry improve uh, weed management practices. So I, I need to acknowledge our sponsors our supporters, a tremendous amount of funding uh, from my program comes uh, from, you know, the, the grower funds uh, out there, the Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board uh, and others. And our program is also supported by the crop uh, protection, uh, protection industry, you know, given the nature of our applied work. And then I've been very fortunate. I've been uh, at UW-Madison since uh, January of 2018. Uh, the past six years uh, have been amazing. And in great part because of the people that I've had the chance uh, to work with, uh, all the colleagues here on campus, uh, our, our stakeholders uh, across the state, and also this amazing group of individuals that you see in these pictures here. In these pictures, we have uh, you know, our, our traditional uh, lab picture that we take uh, once a year. A lot of students have come and gone, and staff, and uh, a truly amazing group of people that do excellent work. So I get to be here today and present uh, some cool research findings uh, to you all and help our clientele that way. So this is the outline uh, for my presentation today. I would like to discuss a little bit the impact that weeds have in agriculture. Uh, I would like to spend some time talking about chemical uh, weed control with synthetic herbicides. Uh, there's a lot of uh, preconceived notion uh, regarding herbicides. There's a lot of concern, uh, but today what I would like to do is provide some information on why herbicides have become uh, so important for most of our growers out there and how they can help us uh, sustain uh, food production to feed uh, a global world, okay? Uh, next, I'm gonna talk about water hemp, uh, and then I'm gonna then uh, wrap my presentation talking about for the need uh, of integrated uh, weed management. Just uh, to set the stage, I would like to start off uh, with a couple definitions uh, from the Weed Science Society of America. First of all, I just wanna define, most of us are well familiar with what a weed is, but I just wanna provide the official definition uh, from the Weed Science Society of America. And our society defines weed as a plant that causes economic losses or ecological damage, creates health problems for humans or animals, or is undesirable where it is growing, okay? And for our research program here, uh, the weeds that we focus on are the plants that cause economic losses to agricultural systems, particularly to corn, soybeans, uh, and small grains, which are the crops that I'm responsible for here in the state of Wisconsin as part of my research and extension appointment, okay? The other definition that I want to share here today, because we're going to be talking a lot about that, is herbicide resistance. And our society defines resistance uh, as the inherited ability of a plant to survive and reproduce following exposure to a dose of herbicide normally lethal to the wild type. In a plant, resistance may be naturally occurring or induced by such techniques as genetic engineering or selection of variants produced by tissue culture or uh, mutagenesis. And the species that we work with, uh, they have evolved uh, resistance over time in the sense that main herbicides, they used to work uh, a couple decades or a few years ago, but because of selection pressure and natural evolution that is constantly occurring amongst weed populations, these plants are now uh, resistant. And that means the loss uh, of an important tool for our growers when resistance occurs. 
here's some tremendous work uh, that has been done uh, by the Weed Science Society of America, the Weed Loss uh, Committee. Uh, and what this committee has done, they've published a series of papers documenting the impacts that uncontrolled weeds could have uh, in crop production in North America, okay, primarily including uh, United States and Canada. So first I have some data from uh, soybean paper and also the corn paper. And what they documented is that without weed control, the yield losses would be up to 52% of an average of 52% in our soybean crops, representing more than $16 billion in annual loss to our farming communities, okay? Now thinking about corn, weed interference in corn on average, if the weeds were not controlled, we would see a 50% reduction in our ability to produce corn. Okay, so tremendous impact on the ability to produce uh, the grains that we need, but also tremendous uh, economic loss. And weeds are not only a problem in corn and soybean systems, weeds are problems in all the crops that we grow out there. So here are uh, reports for other commodity crops or specialty crops, uh, such as dry beans, uh, wheat, we have data on sugar beet, and we have data uh, on potatoes there. And you can see the yield loss is range from 70% uh, in our dry bean crop, 25% in wheat, up to 70% loss in sugar beets. And we're talking a range of 44% average yield loss in our potato in the absence of good strategies uh, for weed control. Okay, so weeds uh, can be very impactful in our ability uh, to produce crops and feed the world. The other aspect uh, of weeds is that once they reproduce at the end of the season, they either produce rhizomes or the annual plants still produce seeds, right? And those seeds, they become problematic in the years to come. Here is a classical study that's been reported uh, in the weed science literature. We use this uh, a lot. And water hemp is a species I'm going to be talking about today. What this study has shown is that about six years after after six years of that seed being formed, 14% of those seeds were still viable in the soil seed bank. There are some other species such as common lamb squirters uh, or uh, velvet leaf, which are quite common across the Midwest. And seeds of those species were seen here, 28% were still viable 17 years after burial. Okay, So this idea of letting the plants go to seed is a problem because once they set seeds, they're going to stay in that soil seed bank for many, many years. Okay, And then I would like to take a different approach. Okay, Our, our farmers, uh, they're really hardworking individuals. Uh, through my extension work, through my applied research, uh, my lab, myself, we get to spend a lot of time uh, with farmers. And farmers, they work really, uh, really hard, okay? And they need our support to make uh, best management decisions, but they have a lot of decisions to be made. There is a lot of pressure uh, on them, okay? And they have to be efficient uh, and remain profitable. So I think we got to, you know, take a step back and we got to put ourselves in the farmer's shoes and have a better understanding and appreciation of what goes through their mind. Because if we want to make our, continue to make our food systems more sustainable, we got to be working directly with the farmers rather than just uh, as occurs sometimes pointing fingers at farmers and the agricultural community. Okay, so what is happening across our agricultural landscape? I think this this information here is important to get us to think uh, a little bit. I'll have a bunch of small figures here, but I'm just going to kind of walk you through trends. So this first figure here shows the number of U.S. farms uh, across uh, the United the states and here's what you see here is this downwind uh, downward uh, decline here okay so we have fewer farms out there the farm area is still the same it has been the same since 1850 okay but we have fewer farmers meaning we have larger farms okay the average of the u.s farmer as of 2017 was 57.5 years okay so the average of age of the U.S. farmer is 57.5 years. So the farmers are getting bigger, our farming community is aging, and we have less help. Okay, so this is the trend for farm workers, farm workers on U.S. farms, and we see that tremendous decline. If you take a deeper look, and that's not going to be a point of discussion here today, the majority of that farm labor is foreign-born, and a significant amount is unauthorized foreign born, okay, which adds complication. The other thing I want to discuss is income, okay? The small farmers and the mid-sized farmers out there, most of them 
have a secondary job to add to their annual income. Bigger farms, we're aging, we have to have second job. There's a lot of pressure in our farmers, yet our production continues to go upwards. And that's due to science, breeding efforts, uh, best management practices, but also to our farmers out there. They're listening to what we're saying. They're fine tuning and they are they continue to make improvements to their system. So we need to understand and we need to commend our farmers for the work that they do. And this is where herbicides uh, come in. Uh, herbicides became, you know, readily available and became took off. You know, the adoption of herbicides pretty much took off after World War uh, II, as you see in the figures here. For about thirty years, as a matter of fact, we had more than hundred active ingredients come to market. Okay, we, every three years we had two new sites of action entering the market. So there was a lot of discovery made between the fifties and the eighties, and I'm going to go back to that in a little bit. And as you can see here, herbicides represent the most widely used pesticides. And since the 80s, the amount of pesticides or herbicides has been uh, flat, if you would, okay? So we usually give, here's a yield trend uh, for corn over the past, uh, since 1866, if you would. So you see this flat line until the 40s, and then that line takes off here in the United States. And there's a lot of credit to the hybrid system, you know, plant genetics, uh, plant breedings. But there's also a lot of good management, okay, including good weed control. You can have an elite variety or an elite hybrid, but if you don't have uh, good weed control, you cannot achieve that maximum potential, okay? So here's now uh, switching a little bit and talking about the conditions here in Wisconsin. So these are reports for soybeans and corn. 99% uh, of our acres here in the state of Wisconsin, soybean acres get treated with a herbicide and more than 95% of our corn acres get treated uh, with uh, herbicides. And why is that relevant? Myself as an applied scientist, as an extension scientist, my mission, since majority of our farmers, majority of our acres are being uh, treated with herbicides is to make sure our farmers and our applicators, our agronomists are selecting efficacious, environmentally sustainable and economically feasible herbicides, okay? And this is where extension plays a key unbiased role. Every year we supply our growers with research reports and extension publications to support their decisions, okay? And again, weeds are not a problem only in corn and soybeans. Herbicides are not only used in commodity crops. I'm gonna use potatoes here as an example. 95% of our potato acres are also treated uh, with herbicides. And here's also the information that my colleagues, including uh, Dr. Russ Gross here, provide every year to the potato growers so they can make uh, you know, the best decisions that they can uh, for pesticide uh, selection, for pest management in their crops so they can achieve uh, good use. Rodrigo, what is the alternative uh, to herbicides uh, that allow farmers to be efficient, right? We don't have a lot of help out on the farm. We have fewer farmers out there and they're very busy. What else can we be doing? Uh, you know, here's just a picture in the meadow. After a, a day, we spend hand uh, pulling weeds and I think after you have that experience, I think you have a lot more appreciation for the technologies uh, we have available. And as a matter of fact, you talk to people that were growing up in farms 30, 40 years ago, uh, you know, that was their, you know, their worst memories growing up on a farm is, you know, pulling, pulling the weeds. So that's a very labor intensive job. Okay. The alternative, and here's somewhat how weed control gets done in organic crop production systems, rely, you know, heavy reliance on tillage. Okay, so fall tillage, spring tillage, and an interval cultivation. As you can see here, uh, you have the weeds in between. You know, this field has already been tilled multiple times, and the farmer is deploying an interval cultivation here uh, to control weeds in between. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, soil disturbance, uh, a lot of fossil fuel being burned in this case. You know, that doesn't mean no herbicide is more sustainable. I want to make that point. Okay, here's a contrast. Here's a soil conservation, no-till farming. Okay, so the soil was not disturbed, the crops were planted, uh, however, herbicides were used. Okay, so herbicides, again, can be an important tool so we can protect our soil and store carbon uh, in our soils. And then where I'm going next is some of the research that our lab is doing. We can go even beyond through using integrated approaches. Here we have a conservation where we have no-till, cover crops, and then we're planting our cash crop green. And then that cover crop will eventually be terminated with a herbicide, uh, protecting the soil and helping us with weed management. Okay, so I talked a lot about herbicides, they allowed farmers to become efficient. The problem is that before we used to use more diversified approaches, 
but because herbicides were so effective and so, you know, allowed farmers to be so efficient, unfortunately, we oversimplified our systems as far as rotations of our crops go, okay? And we're also, we have also oversimplified uh, our herbicide uh, programs, okay? So there is resistance happening uh, worldwide. It's happening at an alarming level. If you want to learn more, I invite you to check uh, Dr. Ian Heap's uh, website where they keep a database uh, regarding herbicide resistance worldwide. So fascinating information, okay? So resistance continue to evolve. As I indicated earlier, we had a lot of discovery until the 80s. But since the 80s, this line has pretty much been flat. Okay, so we have resistance evolving. We don't have new tools coming to the marketplace. One tool that changed, uh, you know, how we manage, uh, you know, crops and weeds was the Roundup Ready technology. So bio biotech that came in allowed farmers to spray glyphosate post-emergence to certain crops. That technology was phenomenal. For 20 years, it worked great, allowed us to adopt no-till to a very large extent. But unfortunately, we put a lot of selection pressure on glyphosate, and we have a lot of resistance uh, issues now. So a very powerful tool that was not used uh, as it should, perhaps, in an integrated strategy. Hopefully, we learned the lesson, and this is where I'm going to go toward the end of my presentation. On top of all that, we also have consolidation in the crop protection industry. We used to have more than 100 uh, companies out there looking for new active ingredients. We are down to eight uh, main companies. Okay, So we have fewer players. Uh, now looking for uh, potential new compounds that can help. And parts, uh, that, that happened in parts of, you know, during this Roundup Ready era, there was not a lot of incentive. Roundup was doing an excellent job. It was hard to justify, you know, uh, the, you know industry to keep looking for new AIs when a lot of growers are just uh, using, uh, uh, you know, glyphosate as their main tool. So we have that as a challenge uh, our way. The one thing that I want to point here is that resistance are, is evolving. And what's happening to you, we have multiple types of resistance happening within single populations. And that's where it's very concerning. Dr. Gross talked about metabolic resistance in insect populations. We are seeing the same trend in weeds. Okay. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Jed Cahoon, wrote a wonderful piece on this topic. If you're interested, uh, you should look up uh, his publication, Metabolic Herbicide Resistance, the blog, blog article that he wrote uh, describing it. Uh, you know, historically, we scientists, we've focused on target site uh, mutations that confer resistance to specific herbicides. What's happening now, these weeds are evolving this ability uh, to quickly metabolize through their P450s, uh, GSTs, and other enzymes. They can quickly degrade uh, herbicides as they come in. And the concern there is that this is not specific, okay? This types of resistance is not specific to certain herbicides. So by selecting for these types, of plants that have uh, metabolic resistance, we might be pre-selecting for resistance to herbicides that we're not even using, perhaps to herbicides that are yet to be discovered. And that is very concerning. And we have a PhD student in our lab, Felipe Faleco, that is doing a lot of that type uh, of work. Okay, so necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, we have big challenges out there. Herbicide resistance is a big challenge for farmers, uh, but this is where innovation comes, right? I like to say, you can complain how bitter a lime is, or you can slice it and turn it into lemonade. And this is what we're trying to do. And when, we, when I say we, I'm talking about industry, I'm talking about academia, and I'm talking about crop consultants and farmers. There's a lot of innovation happening uh, out in the landscape uh, so we can fight uh, these weeds back. One weed uh, that is very problematic here in our state of Wisconsin, but also across the Midwest is water hemp or Amaranthus tuberculatus, okay? This species is very well adapted to our annual cropping systems, whether it's corn and soybeans or whether it's other specialty crops that get planted in the spring and harvested late summer, fall, okay? These crops always have the same life cycle. And the reason why this species thrive is because it has a very extended emergence window that goes from May all the way to August. Once a seedling is established, it grows really, really fast. It has evolved resistance to multiple herbicides and a single plant, if there's no competition around it, can produce up to 500,000 seeds. Okay, so it's a very competitive and prolific seed. It's actually a native species to Wisconsin. So it's not a species that was introduced. It's actually native to Wisconsin, but it has now quickly adapted to our systems. And what's curious about these pictures that I have in front of you is that both of them were taken on the same day, July 7th of 2021. Here you can see a water hemp plant that's already flowering. Meanwhile, we still have water hemp plants emerging, okay? So it's very difficult to manage 
a weed species that has such an extended emergence window. Again, the species is not only a problem in the crops that I work with, it's also becoming a big problem across our central sands and other parts of the state. These are pictures from my colleague, Dr. Jed Cahoon, uh, and he shared pictures of you know, water hemp infestations and also red weed and pigweed infestation, which is also an amaranthus species in carrot productions in the central sands. Here you see water hemp growing in a mint field. Okay, So it's truly a uh, concerning weed uh, for our state. So when we started here back in 2018, we needed to understand where we're at as far as resistance goes. Because water hemp, when I got here, was kind of becoming a problem in the state of Wisconsin. So our graduate student, Felipe Faleco, has done a lot of extensive work. The samples were submitted to the university by our stakeholders from across the state. And then what we learned is that the two main herbicides that they were using in, corn, in soybean systems, unfortunately, these weeds were already resistant to them. Okay, so Felipe was able to document that more than 95% of our water hemp in the state of Wisconsin that we screened was resistant to both imazepapir and glyphosate, which are important tools in uh, soybean. During the screenings, we also found some populations that had four-way resistance, and that's very concerning. Right now, five years later, farmers are sending again, consultants are sending again their seed samples. We're going to redo this exercise because we want to understand where we're at right now. From the data set, we were able to understand the herbicides that don't work, but we were also able to provide data back, you know, to for the short-term solution for farmers, the herbicides that are working, okay? So we have resistance, this don't work. Now, these herbicides are too effective for your corn and soybeans. Let's make sure we use them wisely. And now by doing this exercise five years later, we want to see whether the efficacy of these tools that were effective five years ago, we want to see where that stands, okay? Those are pictures from back in 2018. That was, again, our first year. We were building our lab, and we knew water hemp was becoming a problem. And at that time, majority of growers controlled weeds and soybeans with post-emergence herbicides, mainly glyphosate, as I described before. What we wanted to investigate is how important and how effective could soil applied herbicides be. And I think to this day, this has been one of the most impactful efforts uh, from our team. We generated a preliminary summary and then a two, three year uh, publication for our growers. So five years ago, 10, less than 10% of our growers adopted soil residual herbicides. Today, more than 75% of our growers are adopting these chemicals because they are the chemicals that are effective for uh, uh, water hemp control. So this has been a fascinating contribution from our program. The one catch, and I'm gonna come back to this later, is to work, there are herbicides that are applied to the soil, they need rainfall in the spring. Okay, so we need rainfall. So when we have normal patterns of rain in the spring, the herbicides work great. When we don't have such as this, such as was the condition for this year, then it becomes more challenging. And I'll come back to that. The other aspect that our lab does a lot of work on is to make sure that our pesticides, when farmers are spraying, they stay on target. Okay, so we've done a series of studies looking at the role of the nozzle tips drift reduction adjuvants added to the spray solution, and also the use of hooded sprayers, as you can see in this picture, as, as opposed to open sprayers. And what we've learned through our research is that by fine-tuning the equipment there, a grower can reduce off-target movement in this research, for instance, by a six-fold, okay, to almost eliminating it uh, from happening. Okay, and that's very, very important. So we want our herbicides to stay on a target so they control the pass. And we don't want them to move towards neighboring sensitive crops, towards water bodies. We don't want those herbicides to go to impact endangered species out there. So we're doing tremendous work on this area. So we make sure that we're delivering our pesticides where they need to be. Okay, which leads me to this question, right? You look at a scenario like this, you have a few scattered weeds, those weeds are getting tall. The recommendation for the grower would be go ahead and apply. And a farmer would deploy a broadcast application across the whole area. Could we spot treat these weeds? For many years, we couldn't. But that's where we're going now. And this is an area of research. We have an active team. We have collaborations with industry and other universities. We're looking at what we call uh, spot spraying or site-specific weed management. What is really fascinating is that the sprayers, they have this camera base that are able now to detect the weeds in between row and only trigger 
only deliver those herbicides where the weeds are necessary, okay? So they can provide tremendous savings for the farmers. They can reduce the environmental load. And what's very fascinating about this technology is that they're, they're traveling across these fields. They're also collecting data. They're generating as applied maps so we can understand the savings, but they're also generating weed distribution maps. And once we have those maps, which is happening now for the first time, we can better you know, deploy practices in the years to come. We can better plan our crop rotations and our integrated management programs in the years to come if we know where the weeds are. So that is fascinating. With that, uh, I wanna switch gears here and I also wanna talk about integrated weed management uh, for the few minutes that I have left. That has been a very important area for our program. We've looked at crops, managing our crops in the sense of planting earlier, narrow row spacing for providing faster canopy, therefore better weed suppression. And one area that I think our lab has gained a lot of recognition is around this planting green system using cover crops, okay? So this is the traditional system in Wisconsin and most of the Midwest, harvest your corn, plant your soybeans next year. It takes about until you know mid to late July for the soybean to close canopy. So we have this tremendous vulnerable period that weeds have an opportunity to establish. There is a very strong movement amongst our farming community regarding soil health, protecting the soil during the fall months. There's a tremendous adoption and interest in cover crops out there. And cover crops are, uh, or conservation crops, if you would, they protect the soil during the months when we don't have a cash crop growing. Okay, so here's an example where a farmer planted zero rye after corn harvest, and that zero rye cover crop is gonna protect the soil until the next crop comes in, okay? From a weed management standpoint, what we've learned is that we need enough biomass to suppress weeds, okay? So if a farmer is growing a cover crop from a soil health perspective, one, why not let that cover crop grow a little more and help them with weed suppression? And that's what we've been working on, okay? However, window here in Wisconsin is really tight uh, between uh, the amount of heat units. It's a large window if you look at the amount of months, but in terms of heat unit for plant growth, it's a very tight window. So how can we optimize biomass production without having to delay crop planting time? Because when our farmers delay crop planting time, they lose yield potential. One strategy that we've been working around is what we call this planting green. Let the cover crop grow, plant green, and then terminate it when the goal will be met with that cover crop, okay? So here's just a range, show what a cover crop looks like in March, protecting the soil, late winter, early spring. And then by May, uh, this is what that cover crop can look like. And the big question is, when is too much? When is too little? Because at this stage, the cover crops decompose really fast. They do not help with weed suppression. At this stage, they're tremendously helping with weed suppression, but they can be problematic from a crop establishment standpoint. So we've done years of work, and this is part of uh, Josette Junior Nunes' uh, PhD dissertation here at UW-Madison in our lab. And Josette has done some phenomenal work to understand how much is needed, okay? And this manuscript was just submitted uh, to our Weed Science Journal. So fingers crossed here, this, this paper is accepted for publication. But here Josette documents the amount that farmers would need of biomass, so about 3,000 max there, to provide 50% reduction in water hemp. Okay, so just by managing that cover crop effectively, letting it accumulate that amount of biomass, we can get tremendous suppression uh, from its residue. Okay, so it's very nice now, not only to talk about this, but have numbers to better guide our farmers with their decisions. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Delaying termination of the rye, optimized biomass accumulation, and improved weed suppression, especially of water hemp. However, Soybean yield was affected by cereal rye when we did not get a good crop stand. So it's more difficult to plant into heavy amounts of cover crops, but also when we have dry years, just like this one. So twice now I talk about the impact of dry years or extreme weather events like the one we had this year. Unfortunately, the tools that work really well, like the pre-herbicides and the cover crops, when we have extreme weather events like this one, they're not as effective or they can harm the subsequent crop. And this is where those extreme weather events become a little more challenging when thinking about integrated weed management. Okay, uh, wrapping up my presentation now, here is kind of a common scenery for us. Uh, in, you know, in our lab, we have multiple events where we host farmers, we show our plots, but this is a special and I think connects well with the topic of today. 
These are actually groups, multiple groups that came from South America, groups of farmers and agronomists. Amaranthus species are also a problem in South America. These farmers are struggling to control these weeds down there. So they came all the way here to North America, to Wisconsin, to spend time with us to learn what is working and what is not working here. So that, that way, not only we have an impact here in our state, but also uh, you know, in other countries. Back to that original picture, the farmer, understanding all the decisions, appreciating what they do. This picture has tremendous meaning to me because this farmer, this picture that I took, he's looking at the ways things have been done on their farm for about 40 years. Okay, conventional tillage, even more, has been a standard practice. After five years of our research, for the first time they implemented cover crops and they were actually gonna plant green the day after I took that picture. So we need to be working closely with our farmers, demonstrating the value. We gotta find the leaders in our community so we can spread the message. And those farmers, they've been very important there, the O'Brien family. As a matter of fact, they're coming to campus this evening because they're receiving the CALS, our college's honorary award for contributing, supporting the college and Wisconsin agriculture. And this is uh, how you know we fine tune our systems and, and make it better and better as we move forward. Okay, this is an exchange of information and all working together. So with that, on Wisconsin, I appreciate your attention. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all very so much. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. Um, and to everyone for joining us and participating today. Thank you to Russ as well. Um, I'd like to just take a, one more minute of your time to let you know about the next Global Conversation opportunity. On November 7th, we have an in-person coffee and conversation surrounding Europe. Um, this is an informal drop-in event where you can make some connections, find resources, and learn more about CALS and UW's engagement in Europe. This will be in 245 Babcock Hall, also known as the new Center for Dairy Research Building from 8.30 to 10 a.m. And our next Global Conversations Grand Challenges will be on November 16th at 1 p.m. And you can register at that link in chat. And hope to see you all again soon. Thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to learning more about what CALS is doing to help feed the world.